Uh, hi, welcome to the WALS afternoon uh, talks. And uh, today we have um, Dr. Steve Goff from Columbia University. He's an invitee uh, of the virology interest group at uh, NIH. And uh, he will talk today about uh, two topics. Uh, the silencing of retroviruses and the host cell factors genetic, involved, and also something um, <laughs> interesting and intriguing, CLAM retroviruses. So for those of you who followed uh, Steve's uh, career, you know he's a professor at Columbia University uh, since 1990. He's also a Howard Hughes investigator since 1993. And uh, he was uh, elected to the Academy of Sciences in 2006. Steve is interested in a variety of uh, topics. He's, uh, I would say, a renaissance scientist. He is interested mainly in uh, DNA technology, but uh, over his career he tackled many other topics. But, uh, but the, his main interest has been also the, uh, the host cell factors involved in uh, stopping uh, retroviruses. He um, trained under a uh, very, very uh, prominent and successful uh, scientist, both uh, uh, Nobel laureate winners, uh, Paul Berg at Stanford during his grad school years, and then as a postdoc under David Baltimore uh, at MIT. Uh, in addition to being a very successful uh, scientist and uh, a fantastic uh, a professor at Columbia University, just to give you a number, Steve published more than 300 publications. 50 of them were in the uh, uh, journals of Cell Science, uh, Nature, and PNAS. But in addition to that, I wanted to tell you today about another uh, aspect of Steve's career is uh, uh, Steve the mentor. Uh, Steve mentored so many people. More than 90% of them are actually PIs and started their own lab as an independent scientist and three of them here at NIH, and for the sake of full disclosure, I'm one of them, the lucky, one of the lucky ones. Um, what I wanted to say also is very important that uh, you'll hear fantastic and elegant science today and beautiful science that Steve always fostered and encouraged us to, to do as his mentees, and we want to thank him for his mentorship. Today you will hear about another two stories of this elegant and beautiful science, and as I mentioned, is uh, proteins that silence retroviruses and clam retroviruses, and we're thrilled you accepted the invitation and we look forward to your talk. Steve. All right. Adila, thank you very much for that very sweet uh, introduction. It's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Um, it's, I feel like it's uh, coming home in some ways. Uh, I've been here uh, so many times and have so many friends that I know here, so it is a pleasure. Um, I'm going to try to talk about, uh, give, give basically two seemingly, uh, and in fact maybe really different uh, talks, but uh, that is representative maybe of the way we think and of the, certainly of the kinds of different sciences that we do uh, in my lab at Columbia. So I. Um, We'll be talking first about some of the work that really represents, I guess, my day job, which is uh, working on uh, the mouse uh, murine leukemia viruses. Uh, and a particular interest of ours in that area lately has been a very old, long-standing problem of how uh, retroviral genomes are silenced in, in embryonic stem cells, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, it's, it represents a, a significant focus of the lab uh, and, and uh, certainly an ongoing uh, area. Um, but then I hope I will squeeze in time at the end for uh, something that, we're, that is more of a, of a fun project for us on the side. Um, and, it, and it's maybe representative of our tendency to pick up oddball topics and, uh, and explore them as much as we can. And there is, there is some thread of, uh, of linkage, as you'll, I hope you'll see, between these two. All right. So, um, so with that, with that, let me dig right in. We'll say that this, this uh, image here is, a, is an image that I think maybe Fadila took um, uh, in the lab. And this re just represents Maloney murine leukemia virus budding 
from the surface of, a, of an infected producer cell. So the story uh, begins with um, the very, very longstanding realization that, that the mouse leukemia viruses uh, that we normally think of as replicating well in any dividing cell is in fact uh, profoundly blocked from replication in embryonic stem cells. So it in, that uh, cell type of silencing includes the true traditional real embryonic stem cells, but also a variety of, of somewhat more differentiated uh, but still primitive stem cells like hematopoietic stem cells. And um, in those cells, it's been known for a long, long time that uh, a very particular stage in the life cycle is profoundly blocked. So uh, in, when you try to infect those cells, in fact, uh, the early events of the life cycle proceed perfectly well. Virus binds to receptors, enters the cell. Um, and if the cells are dividing, that is, a, that is a critical requirement for infection by the mouse leukemia viruses, uh, reverse transcription will occur and integration of the viral DNA will all occur normally. But at that point, the life uh, of the virus stops. The DNA is not uh, transcribed. Uh, and so in that setting, the virus uh, is, is frozen essentially in that state. That fact was really uh, appreciated as a problem uh, very early on when people started to try to do gene therapy because uh, you would want to deliver a gene uh, on a retroviral vector into a variety of, of primitive cells, whether they might be hematopoietic stem cells or true stem cells. And uh, those efforts were uh, immediately uh, a failure because the genes were not well expressed. Um, part of the block is, is attributable to the fact that the promoter uh, that's contained within the viral uh, LTR, long terminal repeat, is in general poorly adapted for high level expression in embryonic stem cells, we think some of the positive transcription factors that are required for expression of the viral DNA are at low levels, but more profoundly, uh, there is an extremely potent block that is targeted to a very specific element in the retroviral DNA, uh, a site we'll talk about called the primer binding site. So embryonic stem cells uniquely recognize the primer binding site and uh, use that site somehow to block transcription. And so the primer binding site, we need to explain. So this, this PBS element um, is a very famous aspect of the retrovirus life cycle. It's a very short 18-19 uh, nucleotide element found in all retroviruses, um, and indeed in most, uh, many, many of the retrotransposons in our genomes. Um, and it's noted for, noteworthy as being complementary um, to a cellular tRNA's 3 prime N. So its main function that we think about it uh, uh, having is in regard to the reverse transcription of the viral genome. So this is an element whose main uh, role in life is to act at the RNA stage. And uh, what we know, of course, about it is that a cellular tRNA, um, always one particular tRNA of the cells many, uh, have, have been chosen by a given virus. And that tRNA is annealed to the viral genome during the assembly and production of virus. Uh, and that plays a critical role as the primer for the initiation of DNA synthesis in the next round when that virus is, enters the next cell. So different retroviruses have evolved to utilize different tRNAs. Um, and in particular, our favorite Maloney murine leukemia virus happens to use proline tRNA. So uh, there is always in each retrovirus a, a different PBS that is evolved to match a given tRNA. Uh, and so that virus has evolved to use that particular tRNA as the primer for DNA synthesis. So that roughly is the linear structure that we would think of. This RNA is long, eight or 10 kilobases long RNA. And this little tRNA is annealed to a particular PBS site near the five prime end of the viral genome. So when this virus uh, delivers the genome into the next cell, the very first thing that happens is that reverse transcriptase extends the three prime end of the tRNA to make a very famous DNA molecule called minus strand strong stop. And that DNA then translocates and goes through a, a variety of other events to finally give us the DNA genome. So the PBS is playing an incredibly critical role in the life of the virus. So in fact, our embryonic stem cells have evolved a system that recognizes that PBS at a very different time of life at the DNA stage of the integrated provirus. 
So this silencing or restriction occurs only in stem cells that we know of when you, in fact, have a silenced provirus sitting in a primitive uh, stem cell. And if you differentiate those cells, they uh, will immediately lose the restriction or profoundly attenuate the restriction. And as a rule, the proviruses will then become induced and expression, not the, the transcription, will become induced. And we presume that this restriction system evolved, perhaps, uh, to protect the germline from insertional mutagenesis. Note that this block does not actually prevent the insertion of the DNA to the cell that was immediately infected. Remember, reverse transcription integration still occurs. But at least you don't have an active viremia and spread um, from cell to cell. So it, it certainly would limit the infection and the introduction of DNAs into the germline. Um, perhaps, as we'll say later, though, uh, a much more important role here is to keep silent all the many endogenous retroviral DNAs that we carry in our germline DNA. We know that the restriction is, is dependent on the entire PBS, pretty much. So um, single base pair mutations uh, anywhere in the PBS pretty much, um, will kill the restriction. And uh, many years ago, Rudy Anish and, and Eric Barkowitz uh, worked with a single base pair change in the middle of the PBS of Maloney uh, as, their, as their standard. And that mutation indeed completely prevents the restriction. But um, if you engineer such a mutation and allow the virus to go through a forced cycle of, uh, of infection, uh, interestingly, that mutation immediately reverts back to the wild type. So if, if you were a cell evolving a restriction, this is a perfect site for you to choose because the virus really cannot mutate this PBS. It needs the site for, for its existence. It needs to be able to anneal the tRNA to the site. And even more amazingly, the, the PBS is actually genetically uh, uh, generated by reverse transcription using the tRNA sequence itself. So when you have finished a round of reverse transcription, uh, each cycle corrects any mutations you might have made because the reverse transcription process doesn't use the PBS of the viral genome to make the DNA. It actually, for one of the strands, uses the tRNA sequence itself. So very quickly, um, the virus will forcibly revert back any mutation that might appear in the PBS back to the wild type sequence. Um, so it's very hard for the virus to escape the restriction by mutation. and so. The restriction that uses that sequence is very, very, you would say, cleverly engineered, perfectly attuned to a critical point uh, on the viral genome. So <clears throat> what was known when we started was that, yes, there was some activity, some apparent protein in embryonic stem cells that recognized the PBS. Uh, and we could see that as uh, a, a gel shift, a gel mobility shift activity that was present in the lysates of nuclei. Of, uh, of, of embryonic stem cells that was specifically targeting DNAs that had the, the Maloney uh, PBS element. I should say that one of the what few ways that a virus can escape this is to, of course, switch the entire PBS to match a completely different tRNA. And retroviruses do exist, indeed, that have done that or that make use of a different tRNA. Um, one of the common ones that we work with in the lab is a virus that uses glutamine rather than proline tRNA as its primer, um, and that uh, is the tRNA used by a virus called the stem cell virus. Why? Because that virus grows well, in fact, on stem cells. So the gene therapists were very happy. They could make use of viruses like this one that used a different tRNA. Um, but the virus can't just switch quickly. It has to make many, many modifications to adapt to use a different tRNA because there are other points of contact on the genome to the tRNA besides the PBS. All right. So we all knew that there was some factor in embryonic stem cells that was recognizing the PBS and then somehow silencing um, the, the nearby integrated provirus from and preventing it from being transcribed. We knew that the silencing had a range which was quite large, um, tens of kb. One could manipulate the PBS in various reporter constructs and test the range. And uh, it acted upstream and downstream. It was independent of orientation uh, and, and would silence uh, promoters that were within many, many KB of the PBS. And if you mutated it by hand, uh, you completely lost the restriction. So something was critically recognizing apparently all 18 nucleotides of the PBS in doing the silencing. So a very talented postdoc. Uh, came to the lab and, and set out 
to identify and characterize this, this activity. So the activity uh, was manifest here as a gel shift activity, as I said, and it's, it was very well behaved. So in a lysate, it would bind and shift labeled DNAs, oligos that included the site. Um, it would be relatively soluble. It was a very large, high molecular weight complex. The gel shift shifted DNA hugely. Um, but it was relatively stable and, and well behaved. And it would fractionate in relatively normal ways. You could do ammonium sulfate cuts. You could put it over columns. Um, and so it, it, uh, we, we could start out trying to purify it. And Dan Wolf did so. Uh, and he worked out a purification scheme through many steps. Um, shown here, I won't walk you through it. Um, but at the end of many of these steps in purification, he had something that was by no means pure, um, but was certainly very, very uh, purified compared to a starting nuclear lysate, and it still had the initial well-behaved shift activity. So we sent that off to the mass spec people, and the major protein that they identified for us was this protein, TRIM28. And that was very satisfying because TRIM28 is a member of a, of a fam very well-studied family now, the TRIM family. Uh, they are of the tripartite mo motif family. It has a ring finger, B box, coiled coil, and sometimes called, therefore, the RBCC family. Um, and they're known to be uh, now key antiviral proteins. Maybe many, most of the members of this family have various activities involved with silencing various viruses. This one, in particular, was well known and studied, as has other names, CAP1, TIF1 beta, um, and it was well known in very different settings to be a repressor, to be essentially a co-repressor. Uh, it acts on probably dozens, maybe hundreds of genes, um, and it is thought to act, was known to act by binding um, to the crab box domains of, of zinc finger uh, containing proteins that were they themselves the DNA binding proteins. So, TRIM28 itself, CAP1, is not a DNA binding protein, but it is tethered to DNA by these zinc finger guys um, and somehow had silencing activity in, in many different settings. Probably um, most studied by Frank Rauscher, but many, many other labs have studied it, its activities in a variety of cells, um, not, inc not including embryonic stem cells particularly. Um, it is known when it is tethered to DNA to then in, interact with a, with a whole host of proteins. Um, and we, in my lab now, are continuing to try to expand the list of proteins that interact with it. They are involved in this repression activity. They include chromatin modifiers like the NERD complex, um, a, a critical protein called HP1 that we'll revisit in a minute, um, and ESETs, uh, the, the histone H3K9 uh, methyltransferase. So I think it's appropriate to think of TRIM28 as a bridging molecule that bridges between various DNA binding proteins and the machinery that's required to mediate the silencing. And those include guys that will play with chromatin, uh, uh, modify histones in the chromatin, and eventually also uh, DNA methyltransferases that will silence eventually the DNA as well. So this was a very attractive protein for us to, to see working at this level. So first, Dan wanted to confirm that, yes, this was really a component of the, of the complex that we were assaying up to this point. Uh, only as a gel shift uh, activity, uh, and it did. So looking back through all the fractionations that he had done, he could show very quickly that this protein's presence, as now measured by Western blot, tracked perfectly with the, with the DNA binding activity. I won't walk you through that, but here's, here's the last column. Uh, here are the fractions. Here's the gel shift activity. And indeed, here's the protein tracking perfectly with the gel shift activity. So it was clearly part of the purified complex. Uh, and it was indeed present on the gel shift band itself. Uh, and he could show that because here's a, super, here's a nice shift uh, working as usual. Um, and um, if we would add antibodies to TRIM28, we got a very nice super shift band. So the protein was there, was being recognized by the antibody, and was being nicely super shifted to a very discrete higher mobility, uh, lower mobility band. Uh, so it was clearly there. Um, and that band uh, behaved as it should in every way. Um, it would compete with cold DNA, uh, just as the authentic band did. Um, everything about this was clearly indicative of the protein being present in the shift complex itself. It had to be expressed in the cells that were 
that were mediating the shift, that were forming the complex, because if we did RNAi mediated knockdown of this gene in ES cells, we could show that we would nicely uh, eliminate the protein as detected by Western blot. That's shown here. And when we did that with appropriate RNAis, um, concordantly with the decrease in the protein level, we very nicely got decreases in the gel shift activity, shown here. So this was tracking. That was very good. Um, this was not due to some funny off-target uh, activity of the RNAi, because we could actually restore the gel shift um, by re-expressing an RNAi-resistant version of TRIM28 with a tag, which we did here. The tag adds extra molecular weight, so the gel shift uh, gets bigger, the protein gets bigger, um, and uh, this was delivered to the cells with an adenovirus vector, um, so uh, by all the criteria. And now this shifted, replaced band had a tag, a MYC tag, so we could now super shift the band with antibodies to MYC, which we could not do normally. So by, by all the possible criteria we could think of, the gene had to be expressed by the cells um, to create the complex that was undergoing the, the gel shift. And this was active indeed in the cells. This was required not just for the gel shift, but was required for the silencing activity. So for these experiments, what we would do typically is measure the efficiency of transduction, if you will, the, the efficiency of transfer of a reporter gene into cells using retroviral vectors that make use of either the wild type um, uh, pro-PBS, a construct which would be silenced in the ES cells, and one that made use of a mutant PBS that would not be silenced. So these two retroviral genomes would be identical throughout with uh, the exception of a single base pair change in the PBS. Um, we would avoid the correction issue most often by transfecting these DNAs, but um, through other tricks we could, we could test these. And by measuring the ratio of expression of those two reporters, we could ask the extent of the silencing and the efficiency of the silencing in particular cell types. So if we compare these two um, for the delivery, say, of G418 resistance um, in ordinary fibroblasts, differentiated cells, these are equally effective. The ratio would be one. Um, if we went into embryonic stem cells or embryonic carcinoma cells, which silence just as well, the ratio would be in the realm of 100. Uh, so this was good silencing. If we looked at the knockdown with a scrambled RNAi, this is slid over, um, the restriction remained. But if we successfully knocked down TRIM28 using a targeted, correctly targeted RNAi, we lost virtually all of the ES cell-specific silencing, and the ratio came back. Close to, close to full one. So um, indeed, TRIM28 had to be expressed for the shift, but also had to be expressed for the silencing. So we knew at this point TRIM28 was a critical component of the silencing complex. It was present. It was required. But certainly it was not the whole story, because as I said, TRIM28 is, is needed, but it's not sufficient. It's not ES cell specific. Um, indeed, it's ubiquitously expressed. It's quite abundant. It's in all cells. Um, and of course, it's not working in differentiated cells. Um, it's not the ES cell specific thing that is making them restrictive. Um, and of course, it's not a DNA binding protein itself. So there was something more important going on. And we really wanted then to know what was the DNA binding component of the complex that was seeing itself, the PBS, um, and, and presumably what would be then the ES cell specific aspect of the, of the complex. So that required further purification. Um, we didn't see anything obvious in the mass spec results um, without that further purification that, that accounted for the activity. And now, though, we could add a TRIM28 immunoaffinity step, which really is a huge, huge purification step. So having then um, pulled out anything in his most highly purified fractions that also had TRIM28, um, and then send that off to mass spec, um, Dan was able to now find um, a smaller, small number of proteins that were candidates. And the key one turned out to be this guy, zinc finger protein 809. Um, that is, the, we think, now the critical um, component. And I'll show you some of the tests we used to confirm that 809 is the key ES cell-specific DNA binding subunit that in mouse cells, in mouse ES cells, is, is responsible for the silencing. So, CFP809 was a previously unknown member of a very, very large uh, family 
there are now uh, probably around 400 zinc finger proteins in the genome, in our genome. So this is the, one of the largest families, uh, maybe outside the olfactory receptor families. Um, this guy uh, contains a crab domain, so this is the crab domain to which TRIM28 binds. Um, and this one has seven zinc fingers, and these are of the very traditional C2H2 type. Um, so these zinc fingers um, broadly recognize about three base pairs of DNA. Um, so these seven would be, in principle, responsible for recognizing about 21 or so base pairs, uh, a reasonable stretch of DNA. Uh, we would certainly predict and now know that this is a DNA binding protein. One of the things we found out very early on is that the C-terminal 50 amino acids of the full-length protein uh, make the protein unbelievably toxic, uh, intolerated essentially in differentiated cells, and, uh, and even somewhat toxic in embryonic cells as well. So, so this is not a protein that is easily expressed. We have no idea why it's toxic. Um, when you try to transfect expression constructs into most cells, they quickly die. Um, so in that setting, you can't study it. But Dan found that if he removed roughly the last 50 amino acids from the C-terminus, the protein lost most of its toxicity, not all of it, um, but it was now workable. Uh, and it retained the DNA binding activities and the silencing activities that we needed. So it remains to this day an unknown issue of, of how it is, why it is that this protein is so toxic um, in, in normal cells and even somewhat toxic in embryonic stem cells. Perhaps that toxicity, whatever it's about, explains why this protein is not just expressed all the time in our cells to protect mouse cells, say, from retroviruses. Um, so uh, one of the things we immediately could show is that recombinant CFP809 made in E. coli all by itself with no other mammalian proteins present was indeed capable of recognizing the proline PBS. Um, so uh, here's that uh, expression. So we simply, these are just bacterial lysates uh, expressing the protein, and we're asking those to bind to uh, DNAs in a gel shift assay, much like the ones we would run in ES nuclear uh, extracts. Uh, and what we found is, yes, if you express 809, you get very nice proline-specific gel shifts. Uh, and if you change any one, indeed, of the 18 base pairs, if you change the, the one used by Yanish, you lose all of that specific um, DNA binding activity. Two other proteins that we also purified in the complex as, and therefore as were candidates for being the critical guys did not do that. Another zinc finger protein didn't do it. Um, a very interesting protein called L1TD1, which is related to L1 elements, doesn't do it. Um, but we know this is genuinely indeed part of the complex, so we don't know what its role is. We're working on that. But 809 was the guy that clearly recognized the, the PBS DNA. Um, and uh, the shift that it generated was of a much higher uh, uh, mobility in the gels. The shift was less. So it was not recreating the full complex. It couldn't do that, of course. But if we mixed it um, with uh, bacterial lysates that were expressing TRIM28, the two of those proteins together uh, also bound and uh, made a much larger complex. So they were on their own with still no other mammalian proteins um, recreating a much better, uh, closer to reality complex on the, on the DNA, and that's shown here. So here's 809 doing, alone doing this, this small shift. Um, here it's not doing it on a mutant PBS, um, but here's the mixture of uh, very, you know, a mixture of, of indeterminate uh, stoichiometry of 809 and trim 28 forming uh, a much larger complex together. Um, and you can see that uh, the comparable amounts, low amounts of, of 809 um, now will bind DNA in the presence of TRIM28 at, at far lower concentrations. So this amount of 809 is, is uh, in the low end. And with TRIM28 now, the affinity is much higher. Uh, the gel shift is much better uh, and closer to the normal size of the gel shift made in an authentic mammalian cell. But this very high uh, shift uh, is, is not very sensitive to the size of the complex. So we think there are actually many more proteins missing uh, in, in not present in this bacterial recombinant uh, formed complex that are present in the real one, even though we don't see much further shifts. But it retains this dramatic specificity uh, where a single base pair kills the binding. So these were two of the key players. Um, maybe most interesting was the fact that if we now simply express 809 
uh, de novo in a differentiated cell. That was all it took um, for a normal cell to recreate the gel shift complex. Everything else that was needed was there. So we could work with endogenous levels of trim 28. If you make zinc finger 809 in a normal mammalian cell, that cell will create the shift, the, the gel bind, the shift, uh, the DNA binding complex very nicely. So, um, um, so here what we've done is simply transfect, I think, 293 cells. It works, turns out, in a variety of cells um, with an expression construct for 809. Um, so uh, clone 5 was a clone that expressed nice levels of 809 in spite of this toxicity issue. We're using now this C-terminally truncated version to avoid the toxicity. Uh, and that cell now will have DNA binding activity that shifts proline, does not shift B2. Uh, it's super shifted with antibodies as it should be to trim 28. Uh, since we're now expressing a flag tag version of 809, it can be shifted also with flag. So, uh, so indeed, 809 as well as trim 28 are present in this, in this complex. And the Western blots here just confirm all the constructs. So a clone like clone 9 that does not express trim 20, uh, ZFP 809 um, doesn't recreate the shift. Everything looked good. And uh, this uh, ectopic expression of 809 in a differentiated cell not only recreated the gel shift complex, but also correctly recreated the antiviral activity, uh, the silencing activity. So here we've taken a whole panel of these clones that have been transfected so as to express 809. The successful ones are indicated here by the Western blot band for 809, those clones that don't have it don't. Um, and then we simply tested those through that same pair of retroviral genomes that use proline or not. And we measure the ratio of uh, their expression and measure the silencing. And so each of the clones that um, don't express 809 have ratios of expression essentially at one. They don't care whether the virus uses proline or not. But every time you express 809, you get very nice proline-specific silencing close to the realm of 100-fold. Um, so the mere expression of 809 was sufficient for the cell to utilize all the rest of the machinery that it already had to create the silencing. And that was not only manifested silencing a reporter uh, that was embedded in a retroviral genome. The reporter could be neomycin resistance or it could be luciferase, but it could also actually repress authentic virus replication so for these experiments, we are simply infecting cells on day zero with viruses that use either proline or the stem cell glutamine uh, PBS. And these viruses are otherwise virtually identical. And those two viruses replicate equally well on ordinary cells, differentiated cells. Um, if the cells um, uh, don't express 809, they, they replicate pretty much equally well. But if those cells now have been engineered to express 809, the proline virus is essentially completely silenced, prevented from replicating, um, whereas the glutamine guys replicates and spreads very well. We, we use the measurement of reverse transcriptase activity present in the culture medium as our readout of viral spread in those experiments. So this was, this was the only guy, the guy that you needed to express to make cells become embryonic-like, at least in regard to their silencing of retroviral genomes. So we've done a lot of work lately to try to look at a bit more about how, these, how this complex works. We know that it's genuinely sitting on the DNA of the silenced retroviruses. Um, this was sort of our entree into that. These are, these are essentially um, chip, chip, sort of cheap, old-fashioned chip experiments where we're cross-linking uh, the complex on DNA, fragmenting, immunoprecipitating, uh, unlinking, and then doing PCR to ask what we have recovered in the, in the chip, in the chromatin IP. Um, and what we find is that, yes, uh, 809 is very nicely cross-linking to, to this, to, with primers that detect the PBS. There's that cross-link. Trim 28 a little less well, but well, well enough. Um, of course, it's, not, it's much more distant from the DNA, so the cross-linking is, is more difficult. Um, but it's clearly there, and it's not there in uh, the cases where the virus is not silenced, the viruses, for example, that use glutamine. So we're pretty sure this whole complex is indeed sitting on the DNA, on the proline PBS in, in vivo in cells. Um, we have asked, is, is this right? That is, is 809 truly the embryonic stem cell specific 
guy. Uh, we were planning to then embark on a long program of looking at the promoter for the 809 gene to ask how is it that it was uh, expressed so well in embryonic stem cells and not in other cells. Um, and we were surprised to find that this is not uh, the case, that in fact uh, 809 messenger RNA is present in all cells. Uh, it's expressed indeed well, um, as measured by RT-PCR at least, in embryonic stem cells, but it's also expressed in fibroblasts and many other differentiated cells at comparable levels uh, to what is found in ES cells. But in spite of that, we've found that the protein is very specific to ES cells. Um, as we can tell with the sera that we have, it's not expressed in differentiated cells, even though the message is. So um, at this point, all we know is that uh, there must be some post-transcriptional regulation going on in the vast majority of our cells um, that prevents something, at least, that pre prevents the correct formation of the protein. We know from immunofluorescence that in cells that express it, it's found both in the nucleus uh, and the cytoplasm, um, but that's all we know very much at this point as to how it, how it is working. So we're certainly just started looking at the lifetime of the protein um, and some issues about how it's translated, and that's to be yet determined. So at this point, our model is that, yeah, there is this large complex um, that is uh, mediating the restriction. Uh, it is something that is largely expressed in many cells, but that when 809 is expressed, this complex is tethered to the critical PBSs, uh, and it must then act to silence uh, the genome. We know that there might be, uh, we know that there are possibly other zinc finger guys that recognize other PBSs. We know there is at least one in mouse cells that recognizes viruses that use lysine tRNA. Um, we suspect that there are more. So I think our current notion is that there's probably an array, a handful of zinc finger uh, proteins that, that mice have evolved and presumably others that humans have evolved that will target this machinery to mediate the silencing of many, but not all, retroviruses that are, uh, that are challenging us um, to, to, to uh, invade our cells. And we continue to ask a lot of questions about how the silencing happens. We know there will be other players. One that we know is important is a protein called HP1. This is heterochromatin protein 1 gamma. There are alpha, beta, gamma um, HP1s. It is a key protein at heterochromatin, um, hence its name. It's present at telomeres and at some euchromatic sites where genes are silenced. It's stabilized in its binding uh, to silenced chromatin by uh, H3K9 marks, dimethyl marks on, on the histone. Um, and it is known to be a key component that brings with it DNA methyltransferases. So we think of it as a bridging molecule from the TRIM28 to guys like the DNA methyltransferases. It's an interesting protein because it mediates stable, heritable silencing uh, on a targeted gene even after the HP1 itself has been removed. Um, so the marks remain, the histone marks and the DNA marks can persist over many generations to continue to silence the genes um, that it has acted upon. And we know it's absolutely critical for the embryonic stem cell silencing because there exist mutants uh, of TRIM28 that have been engineered um, by the French group, Comus et al. These are very elaborately engineered cells, cells in which one allele has been knocked out and the other allele has been replaced by a point mutant of TRIM28 that specifically affects only its interaction with HP1, and these cells were generously provided to us and those had been made in F9 cells, yeah, yeah, embryonic carcinoma cells, perfectly for us. So all we had to do is measure the fold restriction in those cells as compared to normal cells. So here again is that ratio of silencing of the two marker reporter genomes. Those uh, are not silenced. They are equally expressed in rat fibroblasts. They're nicely silenced here for only 40-fold in F9 cells. Um, in hetero normal heterozygote cells where one allele is null, and the other is wild type. There's still plenty of TRIM28 for good silencing, but if we have uh, tests in the cells that have one allele gone and the other mutant, we lose all of the restriction. So HP1's interaction with TRIM28 is critical, totally critical for, this, for the silencing. Um, and we think and we know that there will be others involved, other new proteins involved as well. And so we've learned, done a variety of pro proteomic 
uh, screens to look for what other proteins are bound to each of these players. We found a handful. One that we like a lot is a, is a poorly studied protein called EBP1. Um, it is involved in signal transductions, um, named after its supposed role, at least in, in, in binding ERB3. It has some antiviral histories. Um, it is simulated beyond those things. There's not much known about it. Um, but we found it as binding to zinc finger 809 directly. Um, and what we found is that by RNAi knockdown, we lose most of the silencing. It's not as profound as the loss of TRIM28 or 809 itself, but um, a very large portion of the silencing is lost when you knock down um, EBP1. So we're now embarking on, on that. So let me summarize this, this part of the story, this progress report. Um, we know that silencing is critical to the life of the embryonic stem cell. TRIM28 itself, it, the knockout is lethal uh, in the mouse. That, that lethality is not simply due to the failure to silence um, incoming virus or even uh, probably endogenous retroviruses. Many, many genes are not silenced that need to be silenced. But certainly it is true that when you knock out TRIM28 very early in embryogenesis, there's a massive induction of expression of the endogenous proviruses, so very bad things happen um, without TRIM28. We think the silencing involves histone methyltransferases, DNA methyltransferases, and histone deacetylases now. Um, that's all part of the silencing. We think this whole business is a, is a very general fact of life for stem cells. It is a part of stemness. Um, and there's, there's some uh, ongoing work to show pretty clearly that this is part of the silencing of HIV proviruses in its reservoirs, where it lives in silent cells. Um, and Jonathan Karn and others have shown that knockdown of HP1 indeed activates um, latent HIV1 genomes uh, to the extent that those represent true models of the cells in which HIV1 hides in, the, in, the human, uh, in, an, in an infected human. And all of the work on the silencing that I've told you about pretty much was done by Dan Wolf, and the work um, continues now in my lab with a very talented um, chromatin postdoc, Sharon Schlesinger, and, and, some, and a new graduate student, Gary Wang. We do DNA methylation work in, in collaboration with, with Tim Bester at Columbia, and we are incredibly uh, beholden to the French group for providing us these cell lines. Um, and Martha does everything in the lab. So I'll, I'll end there, um, and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll open to questions later about our efforts on, on silencing. But now I want to turn to the second topic that I hope we can squeeze in here, um, which uh, we have started on just as a kind of fun side project. So um, the, I, I should try to explain how this started. I, um, so basically, I got a phone call uh, one day from uh, uh, Carol Reinish, who is uh, a person that worked most of her life at, at, uh, at Woods Hole, MBL. And uh, she got my name because she was good friends with Ann Gifford. Ann Gifford was the technician in the lab at MIT when I was a postdoc, and they all remembered me uh, 30 years later. And uh, Carol had asked Ann, you know, gee, we, think, we have an interesting leukemia in, in clams, and it, we wonder if maybe it has a viral uh, etiology, and who would she talked to. So Anne said, you should talk to Steve Goff. So she called me up and, um, and told me the story. So, uh, so I'll tell you where we have taken the story in the last couple of years. So the organism of, of interest here is not one you probably think about a lot. Uh, it's Maya arenaria, um, but it's the soft shell clam, the steamer, to be distinguished from the quahog or hard shell clam. Um, I really like soft shell clams. Um, <laughs> And I was, uh, so I was intrigued. So it's a, it's a mollusk. It's, it's uh, native to the, uh, pretty much restricted to the North American East Coast, Canada, New England, uh, Long Island Sound, uh, Chesapeake Bay. It's pretty much extinct now from Chesapeake Bay, uh, not totally. It's a commercially moderately valuable harvest of, of 10 or 20 million dollars a year. But the fact is that it's subject to a neoplastic disease that is of, of rapidly increasing prevalence over the years. Um, and the disease is, is been called variously disseminated neoplasia, DN, or hemic neoplasia. Um, these are what they look like. So, you know, I grew up digging these clams and eating them in my home in, in Massachusetts, so I knew them very well. And I was really sorry to hear that they were being wiped out. Um, a number of beds are, are uh, 
are, are now, like Chesapeake Bay, are pretty much empty. Um, a lot of the beds in New Bedford, Massachusetts, for example, are closed to fishing because of this disease. Um, so it's kind of worrisome. Uh, anyway, so this is what these organisms look like. They're basically a living filter. Um, so they, they pump water over these gills uh, and, and uh, uh, extract nutrients from the water. But you know, um, beyond that part of their lives, they uh, have pretty normal organs. You know, they have a heart. They, they, uh, they, they uh, have a circulation. Uh, in particular, they have uh, hemolymph and they have hemocytes that look pretty much like our lymphocytes. The disease, indeed, um, looks a lot like a leukemia. And so it is wiping out beds in various locations. Um, the incidence in a given geographic area can be 10% of the animals to 90% of the animals being sick or dying. It's progressive and fatal. Uh, it is seasonal. Nobody knows why. Um, but the key is that the disease is characterized by this massive hyperplasia of, of basically leukemia-like cells. So if you stick a needle uh, into the clam and bleed them, um, it's immediately obvious because the, the hemolymph is milky to the naked eye as opposed to being clear, and the, the cell counts are in the realm of, of 10 to the 8th per mil. They're enlarged, they're, I'll show you, they're mitotically active. Um, as I say, very little is known. There is a, there is a surface marker, surface protein, uh, that is identified only as the uh, antigen of an antibody that Carol raised against the leukemia. Um, the best diagnosis beyond uh, the, the, the uh, cell count is, is by flow cytometry because the tumor cells are polyploid or aneuploid. So um, they've, they've clearly uh, undergone some pretty dramatic, we would think of them as oncogenic changes. So normal hemocytes plated on a glass slide adhere, and they look like that. And they look happy. Um, but the leukemia cells are, are round, not inherent, uh, and in mitotically very active and dividing like crazy. So one of Carol's favorite things to do is to take samples or slides and show them to a clinical pathologist um, and, and say, what do you think and, uh, about this patient? And the, the pathologist will usually say, oh, this is a really serious blast. Clearly, this person's very ill. And then she'll say, OK, and by the way, this is a clam, not a, not a human. Um, and the, the pathologist will be immediately very offended that he wasn't told. But you, the point is that he can't tell that this is not a mammalian or human uh, uh, leukemia. So, so uh, to the naked eye, these clams seem to have leukemia. Um, and there's no real serious understanding of the, of the cause. Um, it is, is thought to be associated with environmental pollution. Um, and indeed, a lot of the work in the field has, has uh, tried to, to support that idea. There is certainly support for it. It's known now that there are mutations in P53. Yes, they have P53. They have elevated expression. The P53 is sequestered into the cytoplasm. So there's a lot of interesting things going on with respect to that. Um, most importantly, from our point of view, is there is evidence that it is transmissible between animals, from animal to animal, either by the leukemic cells or even by filtrate. Um, but the cause of that isn't clear. Um, Virus-like particles by, have been reported by EM, and those reports are pretty much dismissed now in the field, not reproduced. Um, there have been now reports of reverse transcriptase. That's what intrigued me the most. Um, and very recently now, just in the last months, um, there are, have been reported very large increases in virus like mRNAs, which are yet uncharacterized except as being detected with primers that were designed generically for retrotransposons. And we suspect that this is what we're talking about today. So um, Carol sent us samples of hemolymph to look at. Um, we simply said, OK, we'll do reverse transcriptase assays. Um, and we do those routinely with, with very crude samples. We can work with tissue culture media directly, throw them into cocktail, and they work. That's our standard way of measuring virus replication. So we use those standard ways to look at hemolymph from disease, high leukemic, middle leukemic, and normal clams. And right away, uh, there were very high levels of reverse transcriptase in the, in the hemolymph of diseased animals medium levels in the intermediate animals and nothing in the normals. So we were immediately 
excited by this, that there was some kind of RT. This was cell-free uh, activity in the, in the hemolymph. Um, and uh, if we cultured uh, the hemo hemocytes in vitro for a, a few days, um, we got even higher levels. So the cells were releasing a lot of RT into the culture medium. The culture uh, uh, situations for these cells are not too bad. They actually grow in MEM with, you know, 10% calf serum. Um, they, they do grow at 10 degrees C instead of 37. Um, and uh, the only other funny thing is you have to add half molar salt um, to the culture medium. That's seawater, basically, but uh, they, they do grow. For, and they don't grow for long. They grow for a few days, and then they poop out, more or less like any primary cell would. But the, we would detect RT activity here as incorporated uh, radioactive triphosphates on homopolymer uh, templates, substrates, just as we always do, on, under the conditions that we use normally for Maloney uh, reverse transcriptase. Um, so, okay, we said if this is real, then we need to clone the, L the DNA from the element that's causing this reverse transcriptase activity. So we extracted RNA from the hottest samples we could get, um, generated cDNA, and we sent it off to 454 four, four, four deep sequencing. Um, we did this with our, with our collaborator across the street, Ian Lipkin, who's, you know, a virus hunter guy at this day and age. Um, so he sent us back about 200,000 reads. Um, from the samples, and we looked hard then uh, at these contigs uh, for retroviral relatedness. And um, there were indeed sequence runs uh, that had homologies to various parts of retroviruses. Most of these were bogus, but the, the good ones were the matches to GAG and especially Paul, mostly Paul. Um, so looking back then with uh, the new primers designed based on the the sequences we had amplified uh, in that, in Gag Pauls, um, we went back to the RNA again, um, used now the better primers instead of the random priming that we had done before, uh, and got very nice fragments that were clearly retroviral-like. And um, we've sequenced them, patched them together, and we now have about 5 kb, basically, of a contig that we think represents a portion, not, not all, of the element in our, in our clams. Um, and we've just started going back and looking at genomic DNA as well. So these were some of those amplifications. Um, so I align them here on the, now the final sequence that we've got. So the initial uh, primer hits were these forward and reverse uh, primers. We were able to amplify some long products, six, eight, nine. You know, most satisfying is that when we had just tiny little fragments and we had uh, sequence pr primers based on those, when we could span all the way from one to the other, we knew we had something, because then it meant they were present on the same RNA molecule. So these long products were each in the realm of, of 2 kb or so. Um, so now we were getting significant sequence reads. So putting everything together, um, we now have a sequence to, to at least look at, to gaze at. These are some of the features that I can tell you about. Um, so we're spanning roughly from uh, the, and aligning these here with just by eye, really, with, with Maloney, um, what we know is that we're going from the nucleocapsid gene through protease, uh, reverse transcriptase, RNase-H, and integrase. Um, so the obvious features in this guy is that it's one long ORF. There's, there's no stop codon between GAG and Paul. Um, no frame shift. Uh, these are all kind of interesting. Um, the nucleocapsid has two apparent zinc fingers. Um, different retroviruses have either one or two in the nucleocapsid. Um, no stop codon. Um, RTs are marked by a, a particular uh, little uh, sequence, uh, YXDD box, so-called, the active site of the box. This guy has an IADD at that box, so it's sort of slightly non-canonical. Non um, the integrase has a zinc finger, um, very traditional. It has a DD35E. These are the catalytic uh, clusters of the integrase. It has them. Um, uh, we have not hit an envelope. Don't, don't know if we're going to. Uh, and we have not yet gotten probably all of the GAG gene. So this is, this is where we are. So it's, it's a seemingly authentic uh, retro element, retrovirus, or retro element sequence. So with that in hand, we thought we should go look back at the expression of this element or virus in clams. So we've done that. So these are uh, RT-PCR levels 
of RNAs extracted from now a new panel of, of normal clans, diagnosis not being perfect, um, or tra transitional or you know, you know, intermediate, intermediately sick clams or frankly sick clams. Um, and you see pretty good correlation. So the normal clams as a rule have no or low expression. Uh, there are samples in here, they are really zero. Uh, I should say for, the, for those of you who worry, I, I went to the supermarket and I bought a bunch of clams from Fairway and uh, they're all completely norm zero. So there's no expression in your garden variety clam in the store. Um, a, a number of the uh, clams that are diagnosed as being uh, partial and most of the clams that are sick have enormously high levels of expression of this element. Um, so that's summarized here over a larger number. So um, normal clams as a rule have, have really no expression and there's a huge range but often extremely high levels of expression um, are present. And that's, that's not unlike retroviral expression in a number of other diseases including human diseases where there's just an enormous range but often high level expression in, in diseased individuals. And the clams are not only expressing RNA, but that RNA is somehow mediating enormous DNA expansion as well because um, the total DNA extracted from the most diseased clams have incredibly high levels of DNA detected here by southern blot. Um, so normal clams have essentially none uh, there are actually, these are digests of genomic DNA, there are faint bands that some of you may be able to see. We think normal clams have about one maybe copy of, uh, of an element, um, but the diseased clams have an enormous ex hundredfold or more expansion of DNA as well. So these are not, these are not RT-PCRs. That means the virus or the element is undergoing active reverse transcription to generate high levels of DNA. Um, we're, we're using probes for different parts of the Paul gene here and we're digesting the DNA with a variety of different restriction enzymes um, and that's allowing us to patch together a map of the genome totally consistent with the sequence we have um, and extending outward. Um, very often we will see fragments that are correctly predicted uh, internal fragments but when we probe we are seeing also flanking uh, sequences of uh, fragments that are outside that indicate that we're having apparently random integration into adjacent DNA of this added DNA. We never see an unintegrated full-length uh, freestanding copy. We're only seeing this integrated form. Um, uh, and, and importantly, I think in our minds, is that we're not seeing clonal integration. So we're not seeing in the tumors, in the diseased clams ever, indications of, uh, of hot spots of integration that would account for a clonal outgrowth of a, of a hot integration event. We're seeing fully heterogeneous um, integrations uh, in, in all cases. So we don't guess this is acting through insertional activation of the MYC gene, say. Um, but the level of amplification is enormous. This is an internal fragment and it allows us to see that, yeah, there are a faint copy number, we think maybe one copy number in a normal clam that can be amplified as much tens or hundred folds in the disease clams. And that's, that's really where we are. Um, so uh, we know only that there are high levels of reverse transcriptase often present in the hemolymph um, and uh, high levels again in the, in the culture medium from cultured uh, hemocytes. Um, we know that RT activity in the medium is palatable, but we have not visualized the, the virus if it exists by EM yet. Um, we know also there are very high levels of RNA of this element um, in the diseased animals and that it, the levels correlate pretty much with, with the diagnosis. We know the sequence of the Paul region and a bit more, and it really looks like a retro element or retrovirus in many ways, and that there are low copy numbers, maybe one, in the genome of healthy animals and enormously high levels in the diseased animals that are apparently undergoing active reverse transcription. So, um, so we have a lot of things to do. We want to know, is this truly an infectious retrovirus? Can we transmit it, indeed, uh, in culture? We're trying to do that. Um, we need the complete genome. We don't have it. Um, we don't know its full repertoire of, of RNAs and proteins. A lot to be done. It's kind of fun. Um, we don't know its geographic range and we don't know its species host range even. Um, diseases uh, like this are found in other mollusks. Um, so 
uh, could be that we will find elements like this, or maybe this guy itself, in a variety of other species. So Carol and her friends are collecting for us um, other diseased species to look at. Um, and we don't really know if it's an exogenous virus, is it pathogenic, and, and we don't know how it causes disease. So we're, we're having fun. All of this work in my lab on the clams was done by one postdoc, Gloria Arigata, who's a Pew scholar um, and is going back to her native Chile in a couple of months. Um, the, the people out in the field you know, include James Sherry and his students, who a, who's a, works with Carol Reinish at Woods Hole. Uh, and all the sequencing work was, was done with the help of, of Ian Lipkin. And I will stop there and take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. A great talk, as usual. Any questions? Uh, I just want to say that there is a reception after the talk that I forgot to mention during my introduction, so please join us after the talk. Uh, T. So Steve, uh, excellent talk. Um, so um, in terms of your first uh, part uh, about silencing, uh, you would argue that viruses that contain tRNA uh, proline PBS would be silenced if they, for example, infected uh, embryonic uh, uh, cells or stem cells. But we actually have the example, and I think I, you illustrate as one of the examples that HTLV-1 with tRNA proline. But we actually know that HTLV-1 can infect uh, human embryonic uh, uh, stem cells and also uh, human hematopoietic CD34 uh, positive uh, um, you know, cells without any uh, evidence of, of uh, you know, silencing or restriction. So I was just wondering whether you would uh, sort of speculate on, on that. So everything I showed you, and indeed most of all the history, is on mouse uh, embryonic stem cells. So we have just started looking at human ES cells. There isn't very much known. Um, indeed, uh, many human retroviruses like HTLV1 do use proline. So we do not yet know even if the traditional uh, human embryonic stem cells will correctly silence proline tRNA utilizing retroviruses at this point. We're looking at that. We've only uh, relatively recently gotten permission, um, you know, with, with the Bush era problems of, with human ES cells, but we've started collaborations with uh, George Daly to look at, at this issue. Uh, the, the, embryonic stem, the human embryonic stem cell field has not yet got much overlap with the retrovirus world, um, to our surprise. So we're starting to look at this. So we, and there's, we, there's really very little history in human ESLs. There are endogenous human retroviruses, there are HERVs, that utilize essentially the whole array of tRNAs. As you know, the HERVs are all named on the basis of the tRNA that they utilize. So, you know, HERV-K uses lysine and so on. There are HERV-Ps. Uh, as well as the exogenous viruses today that are in epidemic that use proline tRNA. But all that being said, we don't know yet if humans have evolved, uh, have in their repertoire a zinc finger protein that would do the equivalent to what we know the mouse guy can do. It's an interesting thought that although there are mouse retroviruses that use tRNAs that are silenced and that are not, um, they're both out there uh, in, the, in the world and that the genomes of mice are littered with viruses that are silenced as a rule. Um, and we have all those silenced retroviruses in our genomes as well, but how they're silenced isn't clear. So, I, so if I can just uh, have a follow-up, if you could contrast um, your protein-based silencing of, of endogenous retroviruses from retro elements versus the emerging field of high RNA-based uh, silencing. I, I was just wondering if you think, you know, one contributes 50 percent, the other contributes, you know, 50 percent, or one contributes 30 percent. Right. Well, what is your, what is your feeling so on I, that? I wouldn't put numbers yet much on it. I would say that the proline-based silencing in mouse is really, really potent. I think it's, it's, 90, it's probably 95 percent or more of the total silencing. But as you say, there is the pi RNA-mediated one. And 
we're very interested in kind of the second level, a second level protein-based silencing that we know also goes on. So even the glutamine virus family are silenced in mouse stem cells more slowly, less potently, um, and we think utilizing other elements in the LTR. Um, so people have known for a long time there are negative regulatory elements, as they're called, in other parts of retroviral LTRs that are targeted for silencing. We have some ideas for the proteins that might mediate that. So there are clearly backup non-PBS silencing machineries, both of protein and non-protein sorts. And I, I guess the relative efficiencies of those will be different with different viruses in different species. Yeah. Are iPS cells restrictive? Aha. Uh -huh. So we're looking at that with George Daly. Um, the, the early uh, results are that we don't know. Um, so, but uh, yeah, probably. Uh, and then the, if that being said, the next issues would be exactly when. So as George tells us, you know, there are stages of iPS cells from starting with more differentiated cells. So when does it kick in? as we go in that direction back towards stem cells, this, this is what we are very keen to know. We know more going the other way. In mouse, when you take a, a silenced embryonic stem cell and induce this differentiation, we know a lot about when the virus has come on. But I think this will be an interesting story to find out when it is imposed, when you're going backwards in differentiation. There are some other things to say uh, about the story, but it's, those are very interesting questions. There's a question over here. So I was so entertained by the split talk, I actually have one question for each talk. Uh, they're both short. Uh, the first question is, how does the embryonic stem cell avoid shutting off its own endogenous tRNAs? Is it somehow specific for Paul II or something? It's not, um, but there's a very good answer, I think, to this question, which is that um, uh, the silencing element here, the, the PBS, uh, is the, in, it includes the 18 nucleotides of the three prime end of tRNA, so that includes in specifically the CCA bases at the three prime end of the tRNA. So, and those are important. If you don't have those, the PBS is not recognized for silencing. And in fact, the genes for tRNAs don't have those because they're added post-transcriptionally to the tRNA. So that's um, a remarkable fact that the system happens or maybe was evolved even to be able to do that discrimination. So the proviral PBS versions are silenceable, are recognized, the tRNAs are not. So that's the basis for, we guess, the basis for the discrimination. It is a very elegant guess. Uh, so the second question, it might be more of a suggestion. Uh, retroviruses often make one and two LTR circles. So I'm just wondering whether you've thought of hunting the circular DNA from those cells using 529 polymerase rolling circle amplification. You actually make the old pull up the whole genome with high fidelity that way. So I guess what, you know, I mean, what, if I'm understanding you right, what you're saying, what is the state of the DNA in, in those? No, no, it's more that if the DNA is circular, you can use the awesome power of 529 polymerase to selectively amplify the circular sure, DNA. Sure, but I mean, that's true, but, and, and in, when in the case where you don't have any primers to use, any sequence information, that would be... You don't uh, have to care what the sequence right. is. Right, but we think we do it. have primers for our clam guy, so we're just going that way. Um, but we don't know the state of the DNA when it's being amplified. Um, our guess would have been, you know, that, hey, it's just linear, there ought to be some linear that would be the abund most abundant RNA, DNA in a Maloney expansion. But yeah, who knows, could be circular. I, I think the other possible answer will be that it's hopping and that most of the stuff we're seeing is integrated. But I don't know this, yeah. Well, I guess I was gonna ask you the question about tRNA expression, but now I won't. Um, <laughs> okay, well, but they're not silenced in ESL <laughs> anyway. What, what about the neighboring genes? MLV integrates near actively transcribed genes near the promoters. Is this a promoter killer? Of so I, I don't guess we really know to what extent that happens in infected ES cells. Um, of course, it's only in ES cells that this would happen. Um, there's nothing much new to say about that. So in the early days of the discovery of the whole silencing business, Rudy Anish and, and people looked at the spread uh, in art, so it's all artificial constructs. So looking in those, the silencing was spreading over long distances, tens of kb. Um, so presumably that's the case in the in the silencing in ESLs. Yeah. 
A very short question. There are so many antiviral drugs. Did you by chance sprinkle any of those things? In, to use them to treat clams or something, no. So that, was, that is an interesting thought. I don't guess we can treat clams with AZT, but um, as one of the early things we want to do is express the RT, uh, make a lot of it, and then, and then really characterize it the way we would characterize any retroviral RT. We're just starting that. And among the characterizations would be to ask what drugs work on it. You know, if we were really serious about about solving the problem of this disease, if it is viral in, in origin, we don't know this yet, um, there would be a path. The path would be, in my view, to make a, a resistant clam. And uh, that's not totally crazy to imagine because uh, they're actually pretty amenable to, to uh, manipulation at the DNA level. You can, uh, they make a lot of sperm and a lot of eggs and you can, you know, at that level, you can work with them as genetic organisms. They're not the fastest organisms in the world, but they're workable. And so if there were a receptor, for example, for the virus, I could imagine generating a, a receptor negative clam, and that would save the world. But you know, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, on the thought of saving the clams, uh, <laughs> please um, join us to continue this conversation with Steve at the reception. Thank you for coming, and thank you for a great talk. Thanks.